All right, guys, welcome to another episode. In this quick episode, I'm going to be talking about um, dog injuries, minor injuries, and just general wear and tear of working dogs, dogs in general, but specifically working dogs. I'm doing this as part one um, because part two is going to be me talking to uh, one of my buddies uh, where he is currently experiencing this with his dog. So there's going to be an interview that will be sort of like a, we're going to be just chatting about the injuries that his dog is going through, how it happened, um, how he's coping with it. And we're going to sort of bounce ideas back and forth. I'm going to tell him what helped me with some of the injuries my dog has had. And this is sort of a bit of a preview to what's coming on that interview. So to talk about minor injuries here and there, they're, they're a lot more common with, uh, with working dogs. Your average pet dog doesn't really get a whole lot of injuries. Obviously, they can. You know, there's a number of things that could happen to any dog, any animal. But your average pet dog, you know, the average pet dog that exercises in the backyard or the average pet dog that hangs out lives a fairly sedentary lifestyle, goes for walks. And yes, you know, they maybe they do go to the park. They do get to run and get plenty of exercise and get to play fetch. Yes, those dogs are just like any animal. They are there is there's a always a possibility that any dog can have some sort of injury. They might twist something, land wrong. A number of things could happen. But when you have working dogs, these are athletes. These are dogs that are constantly working. They're not just exercising, but they're they're actually doing some sort of activity that is very physically strenuous. That's when the possibility of injury goes up dramatically. I've been working with working dogs, okay, specifically working dogs, police dogs, contract working dogs, sport dogs for over 13 years now. And these dogs, are they're, they're doing a lot more than your average pet dog. They're, they're, the way that they exercise and the way that they pass through their weeks is a lot different than your average pet dog. And even if this is a sport dog where they are, you know, a pet dog slash sport dog, it's still the same. They still have these... Uh, strenuous activities that they do on a weekly basis. This could range from protection work, which is what I do, uh, to dog diving, okay? Or it doesn't even have to be, you know, dog diving protection work. It could be retriever work, okay? These hunting dogs that are going through brush, uh, they're going into water, they're retrieving birds right the these are dogs that are not only doing these activities when it has to get done right on trials events but they're also doing these activities in preparation to do these events so even the training the preparation to these events to the hunt to the to the police work to the trial etc the preparation to these events are themselves very strenuous and a lot of times a lot more strenuous than the actual event and what happens is a lot of times with people that have these dogs if we have if you have one of these dogs and and it's kind of your first dog or even your second dog sometimes we don't pay a whole lot of attention because typically we get these dogs when they're young and when these working dogs, when they're young, they're indestructible. They they don't show you because they're so into it. And they're they're bred differently. They're bred to be tough. Okay, that's why they have such a desire to do this. Okay, when they're doing these activities, whether they're dock diving and they're just running full speed so they can jump at the end of the dock, uh, or they're doing disc work, they're doing protection work, which is very, very strenuous type of activity as well. When they're when they're doing this, they're bred for this. So when they're doing all this running and all this lunging and all this, um, you know, biting, all of these things, their adrenaline 
is just going up very high. So they're in that moment of of agitation. They're they're sprinting, whatever they're doing. Their tolerance changes and when they're pumped during the activity which is why we have these dogs they're they're bred for this when they are doing these activities they're so pumped that a lot of times their self-preservation is not even there and this varies from dog to dog and even from breed to breed but when you have all of that combination right the right breed the right temperament the right activity, the possibility of injury goes up even more. You have the combination for a possible injury, and the injury doesn't have to be terrible. And a lot of times it's not terrible. They're not always broken bones, although they can be. Sometimes they're micro injuries. They're, you know, they're, they're uh, muscles that get sore, tendons that get slightly pulled, some slight tearing. And when there are slight micro injuries, what ends up happening is they feel the soreness, but a lot of these dogs don't even complain. They just kind of go through and they just keep going and going and going until these micro injuries become eventually worse and worse and worse. And sometimes what happens is when they're young, you don't notice it because when they're young, like I said, they're indestructible. They just they just go through, right? They go through the, the discomfort. Uh, they're they're very very into it, and you start to see it when they're a little bit older. That's when you start to see it. And the crazier the dog, the less self preservation they have, the worse they are. And I've seen this, and I've experienced it because my dog Rust um, is like that. Just from a very young age, he was always the type of dog that was like, "I'm gonna go for my ball." It didn't matter where his ball landed. Some of the scares I've had is when he was very young and I would take him out of the car he's just so pumped and excited about everything even when I was getting him ready to get him out of the car he would just there's been a couple of times where he would beat me to it and he would just just freaking launch out of the car um, and just land in a way that I would not want a four-month-old puppy to land right and I remember thinking, God, dude, like, you got to be careful. And that's the thing. When when you have these working dogs, the the age to keep in mind is about 14 or 15 months of age. Because up until about 14 months of age, their growth plates are not fully fused yet. When they're about 14 months of age, that's when their body becomes more and more mature. That's when the 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 growth plates are more fused. That's when the 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 structure of the animal is much more um, much more stable than when they are younger. And a lot of times when they're younger, yes, they're feeling these these uh, you know this impact. But because there's such desire in these dogs to do the work, because they're bred for this. Remember, we're not talking about the average pet. A lot of dogs, the average pet. They get like a tiny little twist on their on their paw. They a lot of them will whine and they'll just go, "Yeah, I'm done." The dogs that I'm talking about, they will just go and keep running and running and running. And it's not until after the session that they kind of start limping a little bit. And you're like, "Oh my god, when did that happen?" I experienced this. I've experienced this a number of times. It's one of the reasons that you know I always say to myself, "God, I." I I don't want a fast dog. Fast dogs are really cool. They're awesome to watch, but they have a higher chance of getting injured. So that's what this episode and the conversation that I'm going to have with my friend is going to be about. So we're going to talk about this in more detail. I'm going to give you a lot, obviously, in this episode as well, but that's the thing that I wanted to touch on. Okay, Remember, the, the magic number okay the age that you're looking for is 14 or 15 months of age and the larger the breed the bigger the dog the more careful you have to be about this the more compact they are okay even if even within the same breed there are malinois that are like 80 something pounds and there are malinois that are like the 50 pound range so the more compact they are the more agile they tend to be and the less likely they tend to be to 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 get injured 
whereas the larger dogs are a little bit clumsier. There is a little bit more of a risk that could take place. Plus, the larger they are, the more weight they have on their on their joints. So these are the things that we have to be aware of. Okay, um, I'm reading a book right now. This is a little bit off topic, but not really too much off topic. Uh, this book is called The Forever Dog. If you have not read it, if you haven't picked up that book, strongly recommend it. It's called The Forever Dog, and it was written by Rodney Habib and Dr. Karen Sean Becker. And the book is basically written by two veterinarians that use a more of a uh, more of a holistic approach to to um, treating your dog and preventing illnesses. And a lot of it relies on diet. I'm not going to talk about the whole book. It's a really nice book. Um, and it talks about the different herbs, the different types of foods that reduce inflammation. It's just a bunch of really good stuff on it uh, that, uh, that have definitely given me a lot of eye-opening moments. So I strongly recommend it. A lot of you guys have probably read it. Uh, if you haven't, it's a must read. If you're a dog owner, especially if you work with working dogs, it's a must, must read. So these are things that I'm really starting to pay attention to because my, my dog, I have three Malinois. Um, my wife has uh, her Malinois as well. So we have uh, Rust. He's the oldest. He's eight years old. He was my first working dog um, that was mine. Okay, my very first working dog that was just mine, not a dog that I trained for a for a company that I, you know, when I worked with the contract working dogs. And yes, I was assigned a dog there, um, and I handled dogs in in other companies, but it wasn't like that. It like Russ was the one that I picked out for me to develop as a sport dog. It's my first introduction into sport work was with Rust, and uh, Rust is one of these dogs that has a lot of uh, a lot of enthusiasm for the work that he does and and I've had so many moments I already talk, uh talked about when he a couple of times that he would just jump out of the car just all excited happy to be alive and poof, land in a manner that I didn't want it to, I didn't want him to land he wasn't you know he didn't get injured he didn't limp he didn't break anything but i remember thinking god that's not how i want you to land you gotta be more careful which means i have to be more careful uh he's at other things where you know we've done dock diving dock diving with him as well and there was a time where one of the toys slipped out of his mouth we're on the we're on the deck okay so the deck's about i want to say about six feet off the ground and um and as the 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 ball, the toy came out of his mouth, he didn't even think of it. He was just like, "I'm gonna go after my ball, right?" And um, of course, the ball did not go towards the water; it went towards the ladder. And of course, Russ, instead of just going for his ball, every time his ball is in the air, he lunges for it, full like f just full Superman, right? And so when the when the toy came out of his mouth, instead of him just going, I'm going to get my toy, he goes, just flies in the direction of the ball, which happened to be away from the water, so no cushion there, towards the stairs, right on the gate. So he leaps for that ball, right? And he lands at the very bottom of the stairs, right on top of the gate. And that was one of the worst scares I had. He was about... I want to say about about a year old, okay, maybe a little bit less. So I took him out. I, I'm thinking he broke something because he landed bad. Of course, he didn't care. He just got his ball, and he was excited that he got his ball. So I took him running around. I walked him around just to kind of see. I, I asked one of my coworkers if she could keep an eye on him so that maybe she, she saw something that I didn't. And he was acting fine. He was... There was no no indication of injury whatsoever. No soreness, nothing. But by the way he landed, I thought I'm gonna have to take him to the emergency room. I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to take him to the vet. Something's something happened because the way he landed was just horrific, right? And 
nothing happened. So I'm thinking, okay, well, he's still excited. He has his toy. Uh, maybe he's not feeling it yet because I've, I've had that happen too. And then I was waiting, you know, days. I was like, all right, tomorrow I'm sure he's going to show something. Nothing. And he's had a couple of experiences here and there when we did protection work where he would land in a way that I was like, oh, my God, that looked terrible. And nothing. Like we would finish the training session, and I was thinking, God, I, you know, I, I, he landed pretty bad, or he hit really, really awkwardly when he bit the decoy. Uh, no fault of the decoy, just sometimes you know, when you do protection work, it's a contact sport, so sometimes you're going you're gonna to have bad repetitions here and there. Despite your efforts, despite your skill as a decoy, every once in a while, the catch is not going to be all that smooth. Every once in a while, you're going to fall. It happens. And um, he's had those those times. And I remember thinking, this is probably not good. But he would just walk it off. And he was fine. He, he I was always careful. But every once in a while, these little things would happen. Until about the past couple of years the past few years and you know now he's not you know now he's he's not three four years old anymore now I'm starting to see things that bothered him that would not have bothered him before and I remember the very first time the very first time that he had an injury and I and I was concerned I took him to the vet they you know they did a bunch of tests but the very first time is when this happened about a couple of years ago, I believe, maybe a few years ago now. I'm just doing a training session with him on the grass, and on one of these training sessions, I toss a ball to reward him like nothing, like I do all the time. And on one of these, when I toss a ball to reward him, he runs for the ball like he's done probably thousands of times. And this time, as he lunges for the ball, the ball's already on the ground, he leaps to get the ball. And as he lands, he jams. I, I, feel, I saw his one of his legs jam. And it was like his leg was stiff. And instead of him cushioning that fall, his leg was stiff. And so it jammed like his hip. And it was so bad that he immediately whined. And that's something Rust has never done before. Jammed his leg and immediately whined. He still got the ball. But as he got the ball, he came back to me limping. He was still excited. Like he did that moment of whining, but he was still excited. And I was like, oh, no. I was like, oh, crap. So... <laughs> I um you know I walked him back walked him back to his to his uh to his spot I took care of him and I remember thinking this is probably not good I'm going to keep an eye on it he just kept limping the entire the the rest of the day cuz it was towards the evening and the next day he's still limping so I make an appointment right and it doesn't look like anything is broken. I'm I'm doing the joint manipulation. He's really not showing a whole lot of pain. He does show a little bit of pain when I get to the hip area. So I'm thinking he jacked up his hips. I'm thinking he definitely jacked up his hip. It was bad, right? And uh, I take him to the vet. And they're just kind of doing the joint manipulation. And nothing is happening. There's nothing happening. Everything looks fine. So they were like, just let him rest. He might be all right. And so I let him rest. And weeks later, or maybe a couple of, yeah, but weeks later, that limp is still kind of there. So I take him back to the vet, and I'm like, okay, I need to do x-rays. I need to do ultrasounds, something. Because the way he landed was so bad, and it's been already a couple of weeks, and this does not look good. All right, for Russ to complain... Because he doesn't complain, he he landed on the the bottom of the stairs, and the other half of his body was on the other side of the gate, and the gate was there. So like he almost like did like um, 
like it, he landed like halfway between the inside of the deck and the outside of the deck was that was divided by the gate. And if that didn't make him whine, right? This right here, of course, this is, you know, he's older now. So this made him whine. So I'm, I'm thinking this has to be really bad. So I, I arranged for the ultrasound, the x-rays, and I'm thinking his hip's going to be bad, right? I'm thinking his hip's going to be bad. So the x-rays come out. And he's already like, you know, he's already like five or six. He's not a young dog anymore. And I'm expecting to see just something really bad. And uh, nothing. His x-rays were fine. The um, the vet even said, and the vet, the vet works with working dogs. The vet even said, he's got really nice hips. And I'm like, oh, shit. Well, the hips are good. So in the ultrasound... That's when they saw a little bit of, a little bit of tearing. They're like, yeah, it doesn't even look that bad, but there is some tearing right there that I can definitely see. So um, he just needs to heal. He just needs time. And he was out. Okay, he was out for like six months. No training. No playing with the ball. Just potty. We'll go for walks. And if you've ever met Rust, he's so psychotic about working that he just he doesn't do well with crate rest. He he just goes crazy. He's he's a very unique type of dog. The other two Malinois that I have are not like that. The other two Malinois that I have, I have two other ones, Cinco and Vlad. And Cinco is super chill. Cinco doesn't even want to be a working dog half the time. He's just happy smelling the roses and hey, hanging out. Working for him, it's more like, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll do it. I don't really want to, but I'll do it. So he's a complete contrast to Rust. And then Vlad, Vlad loves to work. He is uh, He's one-year-old now, and he loves to work. But he can chill, too. He loves to work and he can hang out. He's still a young dog. But even Vlad doesn't have the intensity that Rust has. Rust has just an insane, unsatiable appetite for work. So when Rust doesn't work, he goes crazy. So during those six months, that was the very first time that for a very extended period of time, I had to keep Rust away from working. It was very difficult. We didn't do anything. And I was I put him I put him on uh Dazequin. Dazequin is a um it's a joint supplement and uh and it the limping stopped. Okay, there was some slight limping every once in a while. He would run and he would do like a little bonnie hop every once in a while. And then after about six months Probably less, probably after about four months or five months, there was no limping at all. He was now trotting more. He was running. There didn't seem to be any discomfort. So I gave him an extra month. And after about six months, more or less, um, I put him back to work. When I put him back to work, he was normal. He was back to his usual self. And I always watched him and evaluated him afterwards, like the day after, right? And... As I evaluated him, he was fine. I'm like, okay, it seems like maybe he's fully over it. So I started taking him to the chiropractor. I'm thinking, you know, he's already a little bit older. Um, and now the, the injuries are, are they're hitting him differently. And I can relate to this. When I was younger, I mean, I did sports. I did martial arts when I was a kid. Uh, I was just, I had no regards for my for my body when I was very little. I would just jump from high places barefoot a lot of times, um, just fall off my bike, just typical, well, not typical anymore now, but, uh, you know, typical kid decades ago, right? We had no video games. We had some video games, but not, 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 we're not inundated. We were not inundated by technology like kids are now. So I was constantly outside playing, falling, um, just doing things that 
should have sent me to the hospital that didn't. And I never felt any pain. And even, uh, you know, even when I was in high school, I did a little bit of sports there and still no pain. Right. And then after high school, after high school, I joined the the Coast Guard and I was a deckhand. So I was in uh, the Coast Guard for about six years. And four of those years, I was working on, on a deck on a buoy tender. Doing a lot of very physical work, a lot of rigging, a lot of moving chains, carrying heavy, heavy stuff. You know, this is in my early 20s. And I still didn't quite feel it the same way, right? I st- there was still not a whole lot of discomfort. I was invincible. And then I started lifting weights, really heavy weights. Uh, I became really, you know, really um, active with weightlifting. And even then, I, I mean, I started to feel some some soreness and some discomfort here and there by the time I was in my mid-20s, but still not much. Then I started working with dogs when I got out of the Coast Guard right in, the, in my mid-20s. And I was now catching dogs. I was handling dogs. And now I started to kind of feel some discomfort here and there by the time I was in my, in my early, late 20s, early 30s. By the time I got to my mid-30s, I started to feel a lot more. And now, you know, as I'm getting closer to 40, or as I'm getting in my, in my late 30s, now I definitely feel more discomfort than I than I used to feel before, right? And it's it's probably an accumulation, and and I do go to a chiropractor myself, and it's the accumulation of these micro tears over time that when you're young you don't really feel a whole lot, but later you become more aware of those things. You start to think. Uh, those things that I used to do when I was younger, I'm start, I'm starting to kind of feel it a little bit more now. So I can only imagine it's probably the same way with rust. Right? It's probably the same way with our dogs, especially when they are psychotic and crazy and have a an insatiable appetite to work like rust does. So now these guys are starting to feel it a little bit more, and that's what I'm going through and if you have a dog that is right around two years of age three years of age you probably don't see anything you probably don't feel like your dog is completely uncomfortable and you can see the determination and the and the desire to work go completely uninterrupted but by the time the dog starts getting a little bit older that's typically when you start to see it. That's typically when you start to notice, and they also start to notice more and more discomfort each time. You know, this is some of the things that that um, that you deal with when you have a working dog. And one of the other things that has been affecting him has been his elbow. This also started to creep up on him the past few years, the past couple of years. Is his elbow gets a little bit more sore. And, you know, I've done x-rays on the elbows, the, um, the hips. As he, as he showed more and more of this discomfort, now the elbow is starting to show some arthritis. So that is starting to, um, to become noticeable as we look at his joints. And with all the impact that he's had on his body, it only makes sense. He's not mangled. He's not... He's not um he's he's not just limping along. I wouldn't I, I wouldn't put him through that if if that was his daily condition and his regular condition. I would definitely um change his activity or or do something else. I completely retire him if that was the case. But these are some of the things that are starting to happen now as he's aging, as he's getting into into his senior years. Now he's still excited. He's still very very pumped to work. But he has definitely slowed down a bit. Now, some of the things that I have done, some of the ways that I've coped with this are obviously I still have him work. Because a dog like that uh, that doesn't work, they, they, they really go crazy. And I've seen some of the ugly side of rust when he doesn't work. Uh, he does get ugly when he doesn't work. Uh, again, if you 
Just picture a dog that has an insatiable appetite to work. Okay, not just a dog that hangs out and just will chill, but a dog that just loves to work. I'm not saying he has to work 24 hours a day or even every single day, but when he doesn't have that regular schedule, when he doesn't have that regular schedule, and and a decent amount of time goes by, and he hasn't had this release of intensity that's when i start to see him act a little bit a little bit crazy okay uh he becomes more irritable um he becomes more um just amped up and you can see it i I see he becomes much much more irritable it's like he gets he, he gets he has like a shorter fuse when he goes an extended period of time without working. And if I had to put all of his discomfort and all of his injuries and all the breaks he's had to have, again, these are minor injuries. We never had to go to the ER, thank God. But if I had to put all of these time, all this time together, it's probably just over a year of just time not working. Because he had to rest. And that, okay, that can definitely um, make him miss it tremendously. And it's not like we had like a few weeks here, a few weeks there. It's like one was four months, five months. The other one was about six months. And then some other ones here and there. But we had to take it a little bit easy because he was a little bit a little bit in, a little bit inflamed on his elbow um that's happened a couple of times so the the way that I've been able to cope with it and and make it so that he doesn't go crazy is giving him some form of exercise that doesn't aggravate the injuries that he has and that is one thing that I did with him is I taught him to hold Basically, if I give him anything, if I give him a pipe, a tug, anything, okay, anything, a shoe, and I tell them hold, or the command I use is bring. If I tell him bring, which means hold and retrieve, if I tell him bring, he will grab it and hold it. He doesn't chew on it. He just holds it. It's it's a behavior that has been put on cue. And so what I'll do to give him some of that exercise without compromising his health is I'll give him a tug. I'll put a little bit of weight on it, right? So the one I have is a a wedge, but I've done it with a tug as well. A big wedge. I'll give him one of those big ALM tugs and I'll tell him to hold. Now he has the the big, you know, basically like a little sleeve, right? The big wedge, the big tug in his mouth. And it has to be controlled. So now he has to think. He has to think while he's in drive. Not only does he hold it, he, I don't let him run around, but I'll, I'll have him walk with me. So while he's holding it, he has to hold it steady, not chew on it, but actually hold it steady. And then we'll go for a walk. And you can see him thinking and working. He's super pumped without messing his body up. And then when he does pretty good, I'll mark it, I'll reward him, and I'll give him a very quick game of tug with me. All right, so I'll just, he's doing a good job, I'll mark it, yes, and then I'll grab the tug, and I'll, for a very brief moment, just play with him as a reward for holding it. Nothing crazy, he's not swinging, he's not lunging, just play with it for a, for a brief moment, and then I'll give it back to him, and I'll tell him, okay, now you have to hold it. So I put him in drive and out of drive, in drive and out of drive. And that is such a mental exercise for him that it truly does, that exercise alone does come through for us when he has to take these breaks. The other one I'll do is during meal times, uh, I'll make him work a little bit more. So I'll put like, you know, I'll, I'll do some directional stuff. So I'll, 
I'll put like different place bets and I'll tell them, go to this one, go to that one. Uh, I'm not making them run long distances, but I'm making them think. And I'll reward him with his food or I'll reward him with a brief, very brief game of tug. So I won't throw him the tug. I'll walk to him. I'll mark it. And then briefly for a few seconds, he gets to play and and release that pent up energy he has. So those are two ways that I have found very helpful uh, for Russ to get that energy and that excitement when he has to rest. Uh, the other thing I've done too is uh, I've bought a I bought a laser. That's that's definitely an expense. Um, it's a cold laser. It's one thing I've heard about. I've had some friends that have been have had good results with cold lasers. They usually something usually pay somebody, a veterinarian or some sort of cold laser therapist will help you with. Um, my veterinarian, the one who does the chiropractic care on rust, she introduced us to it, so we rented it. Uh, so we we did that for uh, we rented it. And we used it every day on him for a week. And then I decided, you know what, I don't like renting, and I don't want to work around somebody's schedule, so I'm just going to go ahead and buy my own. And uh, if you do that, I'm just going to point you in the right direction right now. If you look up cold lasers, you're going to find all kinds of things. Uh, there are cold lasers that are advertised for like $100. Uh, you can find a bunch on Amazon. Those are probably not good I, I believe just like anything you kind of get what you pay for so what I did is I asked the veterinarian hey if I was interested in buying one of these cold lasers one of the ones that you use where would I go and I and I told her I want one that that would be medical grade one that you guys get and right? one that you guys would buy for your office so she pointed me in the right direction and uh and i and i bought one and they are expensive they range i'm just gonna tell you they range from four thousand dollars okay to about thirty five thousand dollars <laughs> That's the that's the price tag on on them. So you know some of like the some of the the good ones, but on the cheaper end, okay, they're about three four thousand dollars. Then the ones that are a little bit more than that, they range between five to ten thousand dollars, okay. Um, and then then you got the bells and whistles that are you know in the twenty plus thousand dollar range so um again the the one that i got the one that i recommend is make sure it's medical grade make sure it's not one that you see on on aliexpress or or amazon um i recommend if you want to look into that get something that is medical grade so that's something that i'm also doing with rust just to kind of aid and and i'm I'm being more careful with what I feed him. I'm giving him some uh some supplements. I'm not overloading him with supplements, but I'm I'm being more and more aware that I have a working dog that is not ready to slow down at all. He still in his mind thinks he's like, you know, 4. But his body is starting to show signs of you know, I'm a little bit older now. So I'm going to keep working him because he loves it. Okay, I guarantee you if I tell him, hey, you're done, you're like done, done. You're just going to sit there and not do much. That that will probably be worse than him having a terrible injury or being put down. I can guarantee you that. Okay, him not working and just not like actually not working, that is so hard for rust. And I know there are dogs that are like that. 
And I also know there are dogs that are great working dogs that if you retire them, they're happy retiring. I know this too. Okay, I've seen dogs that are like that. And I have probably two of them, the other two, that if I decided, hey, Cinco, you're not going to do any protection work. You're not going to do any competitive obedience. You're just going to be a pet. He'd probably love it. He'd probably be like, sweet, this is awesome. I get to sniff and just BS around and not do a whole lot. Sign me up. Right, even being young, he's probably gonna be that type of dog. That if I decided, you know, if we were like, "Hey, dude, you're not gonna, you're not gonna do this. We're gonna retire you," he'd probably love it. Vlad, Vlad would, he would definitely miss working. He he is more intense. But even Vlad, when you know, Vlad's only a year old. When Vlad is probably like five, six, eight years old, and if we decided, "Hey, dude, you're gonna retire. You're gonna be just a pet now." I can definitely see Vlad going, I can totally do that. I'll, I'll be a pet. I'll be perfectly fine with that. With Rust, and anybody who knows Rust knows this, and they'll agree with me 100%. With Rust, if I tell Rust, hey, dude, you're done. You've done a good job. Let's retire. That will be the worst day of his life. So what I want to do is I want to keep him happy, and I want to keep him working. And we're still competing, okay? We're still competing. We're still training. Um, and as long as he's not showing me, dude, I'm going to break, we're going to keep going. But I'm much, much more careful and much, much more thoughtful about his condition as a little bit of an older dog than when you know he was like three or four and invincible. He's not invincible anymore. So we have to take that into account. And if your dog is about six, seven years of age, and they haven't shown that they're slowing down yet, keep an eye on them because in the next year or two, they will start to slow down a bit. You're going to see a bit of a, a, just a tiny bit of a decline, if not a severe decline. Okay. It really depends on the dog. So those are the different ways, again, the diet, the supplements, um, and the right kind of exercise to keep the dog happy. So anyway, I just wanted to give you this as part one, a little bit of a preview. And on the next part, maybe it has come out, maybe it hasn't come out yet. But the next part, I'm going to be talking to my buddy Alex, and we're going to be chatting about this topic and how he's dealing with it and you know what is going through because his dog is still a young dog. Um, so... We'll see you guys in the next episode.